Can you hear me? So it's um, 4:47 in the afternoon now, and our day is scheduled to be finished by 5:20. So we have about half an hour for uh, our discussion. I have collected some questions here, and if you have more questions, please uh, put them on Slido. Um, so we can also ask questions to uh, Dr. Trencher, who is online with us. So I would like to first ask a question. Um, so are we thinking about setting up a just transition committee uh, commission? Um, so if so, what are the concrete planning um, in the, in this direction? Uh, thank you for your question. So in the future. We definitely have plans to setting to set up a just transition commission. However, everything about um, this commission is still pending. Um, the only thing we can be sure is that we have two um, big parts. The first part is cross de departmental coordination. Uh, we need representatives from all these departments in the commission. And the second part are um, representatives from the private sector, including the industries and academia and uh, the civil society. However, what kind of um, power this commission will have um, is still pending. It has not been decided yet. But we need, for sure, one unit that has an overview of just of just transi transition. I have mentioned that uh, the topic about just transition is actually outside of the 12 strategies that we proposed, which is why we need a commission. And this commission will also play a vital role um, in um, formulating the methodologies. For example, in the vehicle electrification and for energy saving and for carbon sink, there might be some um, cross-references among the issues, but um, some things will also be different, including the uh, stakeholders that we have to communicate with, uh, the methodologies, um, the strategies, and so on. So there will be a lot of technical discussions within the commission. Thank you for sharing. I have um, a question for uh, Dr. Yun and Dr. Trencher. Uh, I'm going to ask in English. Net zero and unemployment in relevant, relevant industries. So you talked about, for example, the um, automobile industry, for example, power generation, and the impact these um, sectors will suffer. Uh, we will start from Dr. Yong. Yeah, thank you for a good question. Uh, I think we should try. There is no exact answer. But I think uh, uh, the social change uh, will bring bigger positive impact if we try. Because, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, the jobs we can make through renewable energy expansion is much bigger than the conventional energy system made. So, but the problem is total social uh, outcome is much bigger. But, you know, in terms of individual, some individual can have some disadvantage, others can have advantage. For example, young generation, if they are prepared well, they can have more chances to have more greener jobs. But you know, the people who already employed in gray industry, they may have some problems. So. At the level of individual, the impact is different. So uh, those who can be uh, negatively impacted, so our society or maybe Taiwanese society should prepare some uh, social network, safety network. 
I think that is the way we should go. And you know, uh, even though the technology is a little bit different, but uh, some training and re-education can make another changes. But the problem is, that, for example, in Korea, all uh, our labor unions sometimes argue the current job position should be maintained even after some social changes, especially energy transition change. But you know, uh, we need to think about newcomers can make another chance, but all the people who already employed should enjoy all chances for employment. So. So in this case, I think a social dialogue is very important. We need to make a social consensus. But in my opinion, we can't have more opportunity. And you know, if we uh, mobilize our society to respond to climate uh, crisis or carbon neutrality, maybe we can contribute to reduction of global uh, GHG emissions and we can have uh, economic advantage. If we just say, just uh, we focus on the cost, we cannot make another chances. So we should make big advantage for society and for the planet, but there is a way, I think. So uh, just uh, we should not stick to all the system. In that case, we cannot make any innovation, any change, and the innovation and change can uh, make bigger chances, opportunity. Always a crisis comes with the risk and opportunity. We should reduce the size of uh, risk, but we can make the size of opportunity bigger. So we should be wiser, I think. Oh, thank you, Dr. Yoon, um, because um, opportunities are challenges, but opportunity, uh, but crisis is opportunity, but it is also um, challenge. Uh, we talked a lot about employment. Um, actually, we have been through many similar, we have seen many similar issues in the past. And now I would like um, Dr. Trencher to answer this question. Um, so yeah, thank you for this uh, opportunity to um, share a few thoughts. So um, I find myself agreeing with um, everything that was um, uh, just mentioned now by my Korean colleague. So um, yeah, I think the um, in Japan's particular context, um, the government has actually sent a very clear signal to the market, and that is basically by the, around the year 2035 that gasoline vehicles uh, will no longer be um, allowed to enter into the marketplace. And so they've done a very good job about sending um, a very uh, clear signal about the speed of change and the direction of technology. And this has given um, you know the, um, the vehicle companies um, well over ten years to make long-term plans here. So I would say that Japan is um, you know probably well on track to to I think being able to mitigate some um, of these um, I think very large-scale um, changes that we can expect to occur in. The various parts of the um, automobile um, value chain. However, I would say that um, on the other hand, the uh, power sector, and I didn't really talk about this today, but I think a challenge that um, I think Korea would be facing, and I guess China as well, and Japan, basically the countries that have um, uh, plant equipment manufacturers. So these are companies that sort of um, make, you know, these um, boilers and these turbines that go into these um, very, very large uh, power plants. And the global market is shrinking. And um, in Japan, for um, I think the past sort of three or four years, the um, heavy equipment manufacturers were faced with um, declining demand for these power stations. And um, that was having um, a big um, impact on the factories that they held because they have very large numbers of workers. And many of these workers are very physical people that you know weld these very large pieces of steel. And um, in the USA, I think, or Europe, if um, a private company is faced with um, a decline in a certain product area, it would very quickly readjust its probably its um, its um, structure and probably um, retrench or fire a large number of people. But this is not done culturally in Japan because of this um, this uh, custom of lifetime employment. So these uh, companies were faced with this need about how to what to do with these workers in the factories. And the short-term response was just to try and look for opportunities to build more coal-fired power plants. And then after realizing that there was a limitation to this, the idea was then how 
we can have to probably have to start opening, um, looking for new markets. So one particular um, factory was converted to a fuel cell factory that's you know trying to tap into the emerging opportunity of the hydrogen economy. And then they invited some consultants in and were having workshops and thinking, what can we do with these large spaces? Because we're experts in making very large things. And one of the ideas was to make um, waste incinerators. And so <laughs> there's um, been a lot of sort of, um, I think, uh, efforts from within these very large companies to sort of think about how they can reinvent themselves. But what we definitely need, I think it's been mentioned already in the discussion, is assistance from the government with these smaller companies that have less cash, that are usually focused more on the short term, just trying to survive each year on helping them sort of, um, you know, step, o- step away from this um, this uh, production line and thinking more long term about, you know, this shrinking market and the changes that they need. So um, this is, I think, um, a big uh, uh, challenge. And then the, the final thing I would like to say is in Japan's case, um, I think like Korea, being a um, export oriented economy, um, we can have the domestic car manufacturers, you know, protest against this idea of phasing out gasoline engines. But um, the rest of the world, as we know, is moving um, very rapidly away from gasoline engines, especially the major markets that really count, which is China, which is America, and which is Europe. And um, so if they want to continue to sort of, you know, sell vehicles in these markets, then they have no choice to, but to follow. And sort of that doesn't actually need the intervention of um, the national government. That's um, global forces that are going to dictate this. And we see that this has already had, had a big impact on um, Japan's um, hydrogen strategy, where um, Toyota and Honda were working very, um, basically making fuel cell vehicles was the center of their um, vehicle electrification, electrification strategy. And you probably noticed that there's not much talk about hydrogen vehicles um, coming out of Japan anymore. We're, we're still going to make them. But the idea is that Toyota and uh, Honda have uh, had to um, accommodate these global forces and these the, the taste of com- consumers in other markets. So global forces, I think, um, are going to be big drivers of the um, transition at the national level in these Asian countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chantry, for your response. During your presentations, I think there are some awkward situation in Japan that's when they are developing renewable energies. There are more uh, questions and problems arise with this waste disposal and also a lot of uh, subsequent issues. So there are many issues that they will happens afterwards. We now receive a lot of questions. And many of them are directed to our government official in Taiwan. And it says that in the National Development Council, you are responsible for coordinations and integrations. What are the challenges you have encountered to overcome? I can also um, raise other questions, but maybe we can invite um, um, our deputy minister to answer first. So the questions that I receive are mostly related to how to coordinate between different ministries and what are the concrete results at the moment. I can't give you very specific concrete results at the moment yet, but I think that many ministries are already mobilized to participate and they are willing to engage and communicate uh, more efficiently between different ministries. And we also notice that some industries or in some ministries, excuse me, in the past may have fewer experiences in public communication and they are learning from each other to make it more effective and more efficient. So I think that's a good sign for some industries and some ministries because they are willing to change. In every sessions and seminars, of course, that everyone's, you may have three people with five different opinions, but it is difficult to get consensus. I don't think that just transitions will have the perfect answer, even after deliberation and discussion. 
as something we have to continue to work on as a work in progress. When we discuss about net zero policy within the governments or discussions with industries or public, I think the information transparency will be helpful, so everyone can make a more informed decision. It's difficult, but it's something we have to do to offer transparency, and also we need to be willing to engage in the long term. These things will not be resolved in one or two meetings. I think that. Several presenters today have mentioned about um, how to plan our land, how to use our limited land mass, and that's something we have to think about as well. I have noticed a questions for Mr. Ye. I will also have liked to refer this question to other presenter here from Korea and Japan as well. We care about employment. And we hope that no one is left behind. However, industries have been changing and evolving all the time. Our cement industries are almost eliminated now because of its high pollution. Other industries are also changing. We are moving to smarter and digital developments, and some old jobs are eliminated as well.、Um, so these things happens all the time. Every transitions. Will jeopardize some job opportunities, and people have to retrain and upskill. So, I would like to ask all the presenters here: in this net zero transition process, how is it different from previous transition we have seen in the past in the history? Maybe we、we'll、start with Mr. Ye. During the transition process, just like what the moderator have mentioned, there will be job losses. There will be new jobs appear. The old production methods will be outdated, and some old jobs will be eliminated or will be forgotten. But I think that. In the net zero transition process, there are several major challenge to the current labors because in this current process, you face more uncertainties. People would think that 2050 is very distant from them at the moment. For investors and capitalists, they would have more buffer zones to take actions. And transform themselves, but for labors, it's more difficult for them to prepare. If they do not receive government assistance or some incentives or subsidize subsidies, they will lose their job once all the fossil fuel vehicles are phased out.、Um, so we are seeing some uncertainties to these labors.、Uh, for these labors, how do they adjust? Along the way, they may not have a clue or any、um, any tips at all. So we need to offer them some training and support.、Um, just take the example that I mentioned before. For that industrial park, if you want to, whether you close it or you relocate it. What will happen to those workers in the local areas if they are going to relocate with those、uh, factories? Are you going to have a designated area for petrochemical industries? So these are all the questions that labor would want to ask and would want to have answers before these changes happened. So a lot of、um, a lot of labors are confused and clueless in the process. I think that nowadays、um, the employment relationship is different from old times. In the past, is a very direct employer and employee relationship, but now you are seeing outsourcings, insourcings,、um, 
all different kind of gigs and all different kind of uh, employment models. Maybe some employees work in this company, but they are not included in the headcounts. So how do you calculate and how do you prepare them? Because their employment contract may be terminated at any time. And all those out outsourced people will be cut away, uh, will be cut out right away. I don't think those outsourcing uh, manpower are calculated or are included in official statistics at all. So it may become a gap or a um, black hole in the society that government's policies will not cover. For these gig workers or outsourced workers, they may receive stable salaries during the prosperity. However, that they do not have enough savings for them to survive over six months of unemployment. So there are a lot of frequent changes they may encounter in the near futures when our industries need to shift. Uh, so this is a new issue. Maybe it happens with the current workforce. Thank you for your answers. I think that employment conditions now are different from the past. Maybe we now invite uh, the deputy minister. I think this is a huge topic, but I can respond briefly. For the employment markets, of course, we want to have the social security net. It cl includes job trainings as well as um, employment insurance. And we need to reveal that whether our labor policy has sufficient support and protections for all the employers and employees. And of course, that we can discuss about whether our policy are targeted enough. Just like what Mr. Ye have mentioned before, for climate change and um, digital transformations, we are seeing new jobs and new kind of working models like the gig economy now. And of course, that once again, we have to review the labor policy. As we see new working models emerge, we have to catch up and then to follow these changes in our policy framework. And we've been discussing, we have been in discussion with these changes since 2018. Um, the job employments and labor insurances uh, are important for them. We also need to think about the economic policies. We need to discuss about circular economy. If we are maintaining that kind of linear economy, traditional uh, manufacturing models, it will be difficult for us to find new opportunities because the new opportunities happens within circular economy. And this is a big topic that I cannot cover and answer in such a short time, but we do have to adapt to the new working conditions. Um, Maybe we can invite uh, Dr. Yunz and Dr. Trenters to respond to this as well. How do you see the difference between this transitions and previous transitions in the history? What are the differences now? Maybe we start with Dr. Yun. Uh, yeah, in our history, uh, human beings or society has changed uh, several times. Uh, as a person, scholar, whose major is energy policy, I think uh, human history is a kind of energy history. Uh, when you think about our human history, the energy, the amount of energy, and the sources of energy we uh, have consumed changed a lot. But you know, in our history, such change was happened. Uh, because of lack of uh, some energy sources we have depended or uh, new, uh, something new we have invented. But 
the current transition we have to make is intentional change, very different from previous change. Intentional change means we know why we should uh, change and we know which direction we should go. Carbon neutral and climate resilient society. So we have some direction and we make intentional change that is very different from previous transition. And you know, in our history, for example, very small example, uh, when I was young in Korea, we used the bracket uh, uh, to heat our rooms or to cook. But nowadays, we uh, few people use that. Mostly, we use natural gas, and currently, more and more people use electricity. But you know, there were some people who deliver that bracket, or in the kitchen, we use the propane gas, not uh, town gas. So, the propane gas should be delivered. So we had many, many workers to deliver that propane gas, but I cannot see any anyone left. So what happened to them? Just that they changed themselves, they just survived. But you know, we have grown with big capacity, bigger capacity, with uh, better technology now. So we can have some kind of capacity to make intentional change. And so that spirit, we can say, no one left behind. But we cannot say that in the past because we didn't have that capacity. But now I think uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, and Japan have have such kind of capacity. So I think uh, when we talk about uh, uh, BC analysis for carbon neutrality, People just say, how much cost needs to be uh, required for carbon neutrality? But in that case, I, cha I ask, we should change the question. How? If we do not respond, how much cost burden we should be uh, uh, bear? So, you know, such cost is much bigger, the cost we have to pay for change. So we should change and we can uh, make uh, more chances toward the carbon neutrality. I don't think we cannot stick to, we should not stick to the past. We cannot maintain because our climate crisis do not allow us. So carbon neutrality is international norm. We should change. So we should make the way how to make it possible. So I think we can mobilize our wisdom and the very advanced technology. I think we have capacity. Thank you, Dr. Jung. So the goal of um, the just transition is very, very clear. We have to do this by 2050. And now I would like to ask Dr. Trencher to speak. Thank you very much. Um, I like this question very much. It's um, quite difficult to respond to, um, but I think it's very important, um, you know, looking back from history and uh, learning from this and then applying lessons to um, make our um, transition into the future smoother and more uh, successful. So um, I think that, you know, in the, in the case of um, especially Japan, there definitely have been historical um, ch industrial ch transformations, changes. And it was just raised uh, in the previous comments um, from Korea here that in the past, often there were unplanned. For example, Japan has lost its semiconductor industry. I think a lot of the semiconductor factories have gone to Taiwan, for example. And um, we've also um, seen a reduction in our steelmaking industries and also our solar PV industry. We lost that to China. But all of these, you could say, were kind of accidents. We didn't intend for this to happen. And we could also argue that they were often concentrated in very sort of, you know, niche, even though they were economically important, they were still very niche areas. But what we're talking about now is um, a very wide, very cross-cutting conversation that's basically about removing fossil fuels from not only the energy mix, which is very abstract, but it's basically removing fossil fuels from our lives, and that affects everybody. And this is extremely wide-reaching, and it has to be done um, in terms, if you look at the amount of time it's taken to build up the infrastructure for, um, for fossil fuels, and if you look at the amount of time it's taken to develop these technologies and to deploy them, 
we're going to do the reverse now and dismantle all this. This is extremely disruptive. So the key word here is, um, I guess it's going to be um, hopefully a planned transition, but it's going to be incredibly disruptive. And so the consequences of this are going to be extremely large scale. And we know, we know this. So again, we have the ability to plan for the future and hopefully to deliberate. But I would just like to um, emphasize, so um, it was just raised a moment ago that um, this is very important for environmental reasons. So environmental policy is a very large driver behind the transition this time. But the problem is, if there are too many sort of negative impacts, then we're going to um, um, risk creating societal backlash where people start to protest and people start to say, slow down, we don't support um, you know, climate neutrality anymore. And I think that that implication came from one of the earlier presentations where the um, speakers were presenting the reports um, of a just transition survey in Taiwan. And I was very surprised to see that there's not much, um, I think, societal awareness about the concept of sort of, you know, the just transition and the need to um, completely eliminate carbon emissions. So if we sort of, um, if there are too many workers and factories and assets that are, negative, that are harmed, especially in an economic sense or in um, sort of um, people's livelihoods, people's lives suffer, then this is going to, we can assume, slow down the transition. And that would have um, very, you know, negative impacts um, for the global um, economy and for the you know, human species when we're faced with this climate crisis. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing, Dr. Chen Chur. Uh, there is uh, another question on my list, which I uh, paid it uh, which many people have asked over the past couple of years uh, regard, uh, regarding TSMC. So it's about how much um, power and water TSMC consumes and whether it has to uh, make more contributions to the society as a cause. So I would like some uh, rapid fire answers from the speakers. So um, can you give TSMC some suggestions about what more they can do. Oh, I'm not too sure uh, what answer to give here. I think it is true that TSMC um, uh, consumes a lot of um, resources, um, also in terms of uh, manpower. But if I don't take TSMC as an example, as a specific example, uh, what we're talking about here regarding production, um, workforce, uh, water, electricity, I think we have to remain flexible. Otherwise, uh, we will face some risks. Some employment um, issues. Um, when we think about economy, we used to do it in a very um, straightforward way, uh, which is if we don't need anything, we just get rid of it. If we don't need um, these workers, we'll just get rid of them. But we have to change this now. Um, and this has something to do with um, how we rethink the economy. So, so there was a question about um, environmental assessment uh, online. Uh, and I think we need to um, incorporate uh, the element of environmental assessment in um, national spatial planning. But I think we have to do this in a different way. In the Taiwanese society, we have encountered some bottlenecks for environmental assessment, uh, which is why I think I don't want a standard operating procedure, so to speak, when it comes to environmental assessment for the national spatial planning. I want to test it on a smaller scale, and if it works, we will extend it to different fields. Uh, I would like Dr. Yong and Dr. Trencher to answer the question regarding uh, TSMC now. <laughs> I think uh, TSMC is one of the most famous uh, semiconductor manufacturing uh, company in Taiwan. Uh, and you know, uh, TSMC already registered, uh, participated in Ali 100 uh, much uh, earlier than uh, Samsung. Samsung Electronics uh, just uh, maybe uh, joined Ali 100 uh, 
two or one or two months ago. So we, uh, some Koreans are very worried about the Samsung Electronics position, uh, because if, uh, Samsung Electronics cannot, uh, make a 100% renewable energy electricity, uh, they cannot supply, uh, the parts for Apple and other, uh, companies. So, uh, TSMC is more competitive than Samsung Electronics. So, uh, but now Samsung Electronics joined Ali 100. Maybe, uh, the question is the same, uh, to Samsung, I think, not just the TMC, TSMC in Taiwan, uh, Samsung Electronics in Korea, the same position, I think. Yeah, they should contribute. They should exercise a social responsibility. But the issue is they already uh, employed uh, big numbers of people. So if they leave uh, Korea or Taiwan, if you get uh, some difficulties in job loss, uh, unemployment, and they pay for some cooperative cooperation uh, tax, I think. So uh, it gives us, uh, it uh, contributes to your society and in Samsung's case, our society. But people think that's not enough. So, you know, nowadays ESG management is very important. So it means they do not think about the uh, questions raised here. They cannot maintain the corporate uh, sustainability. So it's not just for society itself, it for themselves, still it is very important. So people here and people in Korea should, ha should monitor them, not to make greenwashing. And they can do their best for ESG management and Ali 100 and our society and the Taiwan society should keep support them to utilize uh, uh, sufficient uh, renewable energy electricity. In that sense, Korea is much behind. Our renewable energy is just 8.6% uh, of total electricity generation. So, you know, in that case, Samsung Electronics can leave or other big uh, company can leave. So Korean government should promote and should push, should expand the renewable energy uh, electricity as soon as possible. That is uh, uh, government role and uh, the company's role and the civil society role. Everybody, every sector has their own role and we should make uh, some integrative cooperation to make uh, carbon neutral society all together. Thank you, Dr. Young. Uh, Samsung is, of course, a very big company in Korea. And now I would like to hear the answer from uh, Dr. Trencher. Um, difficult for me to answer <laughs> being based in Japan and not having much knowledge about the semiconductor industry in, um, in Taiwan. Um, however, <laughs> what I think um, differentiates this particular company from other companies is that it's um, a consumer of um, energy, especially electricity. And um, often um, it's the case that we have um, these large scale consumers of electricity that are more sort of in tune with the need for the energy transition. They want to um, be committing towards 100% um, renewable electricity. And so um, Samsung has um, a, a member of this RE100 alliance, but we have lots of Japanese electric electronic companies as well. Um, this would include uh, Fujitsu, this would include uh, Liko, uh, for example. And so when we have these um, companies, um, you know, committing to 100% renewable energy and then looking for um, the providers, that are, you know, um, projects that can supply very large amounts of renewable electricity and that can supply that at a very cheap cost because it's important that this renewable energy is, uh, is cheap. Um, so this can have a very, very large driving um, uh, impact on the energy transition, or the, especially in the electricity sector in that particular country. So as an external person um, that's you know, outside of Taiwan that doesn't have knowledge about the semiconductor industry, I um, would just hope that um, TSMC is um, sort of, um, yeah, it would be accelerating towards this target of 100% electricity from renewables, because this would be a very, very important um, driver for um, uh, the um, transition in Taiwan. And I think it's, it would be a very important symbol because um, a lot of people now, now, of course, they want to see less fossil fuels in the economy, 
but they also want to know that when we're supplying, you know, these parts, you know, semiconductors for electric vehicles, batteries, um, we, we want to see these being produced with clean energy. So um, semiconductors from clean energy, this will be very um, important, I think, symbol for the energy transition. Thank you. TSMC is actually um, opening up a, com a factory in Japan. So Japan might also see some similar issues that we have experienced here. So now um, our conference is coming to an end today. Thank you so much for sharing, um, especially uh, for showing us the examples from Japan and Korea, uh, for showing us the challenges and the targets and the goals. Uh, thank all of you for being here, either here or online. Um, thank you so much again.